Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining. It's such a pleasure to see you all today. My name is Pallavi Sharma, and I go by the pronouns she, her, hers. I'm a practicing artist and an independent curator and educator. I teach here at CCA in Critical Ethnic Studies program. I'm very thankful to Creative Citizens in Action Initiative at CCA for this opportunity to organize and host Catalyst for Change, Asian American Narratives, a series of artists talk featuring San Francisco Bay Area, Asian American artists, curators who integrate their identity, personal and community experiences, and address social and political issues through their artwork. Uh, in past segments, we had artist and curator Ria Lindy Guzman, Irene Vibhava, Reiko Fuji, uh, and today we have uh, Ellen Pepp. Uh, welcome, Ellen. A very warm welcome to you. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation. Um, I would like to uh, begin our uh, session with uh, land acknowledgement. Uh, California College of the Art campuses are located in Houston and Hillam, also known as Oakland and San Francisco, respectively on the unceded territories of Checheneo and Remetush Ohlone peoples who have continuously lived upon this land since time immemorial. We recognize the historic discrimination and violence inflicted upon indigenous people in California and the Americas, including their forced removal from their ancestral lands and the deliberate and systematic destruction of their communities and culture. CCA honors indigenous peoples, past, present, and future here and around the world. And we wish to pay respect to local elders, including those of the lands from which you are joining us virtually today. If you are unsure of whose land you are currently residing upon, we encourage you to visit nativeland.ca. Uh, this program is part of uh, the Creative Citizens in Action Initiative at CCA and is funded by an endowment gift to support the Deborah and Kenneth Nowak Creative Citizens Series, an annual series of public programs focused on creative activism. Uh, I would like to read out a little bio of Ellen. Um, Ellen Beth has been exhibiting her work since 1980s, drawing from her Japanese heritage to create a wide range of art from wearable art, textile paintings, taiko drumming performance, theatrical costuming, mixed media collage, and hand cut paper. She remembers being exposed to Japanese art in an early age, inspired by her immigrant grandparents. Her subsequent interest in the folk art traditions of Asia and Latin America led her to textiles art research in indigenous communities of Guatemala, Peru, and Mexico, as well as humanitarian and cultural exchange projects in Nicaragua, Cuba, and Mexico. Such activities have informed much of her art, which addresses issues of displacement, political identity, and social injustice, including World War II, American concentration camps, and the genocide of indigenous people. Since 1980s, she has exhibited her art nationally, including at the Oakland Museum of California, the Berkeley Art Center, uh, Mission Cultural Center, Jamaica Art Center of New York, Soma Arts Cultural Center, and others. In 1988, she co-founded 911 Studios, an artist-owned live-work complex in Oakland, where her studio is still based. Welcome, Reko. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Welcome, Ellen. It's like Reko is on my mind. <laughs> That's my middle name. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, 
Sure. Um, so uh, we'll have first 45 minutes of Ellen's presentation, uh, and then uh, it will be followed by Q&A session. Uh, at that time, we will switch off the recording so that we can have a candid, candid conversation with Ellen. Um, take it from here, Ellen. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Pallavi. And um, I'm really excited to be able to speak to you and your class and, and wonderful to see familiar faces, too, on the screen. Um, I just want to warn you, I'm having, I, my internet gets kind of shaky, so um, I, I may, I don't know what's going to happen, so just to let you know, okay. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is kind of a combination of a um, history lesson and a, um, a history lesson and an autobiography and a um, art show all in one. So um, I just, first of all, I want to say that I didn't actually set out to become an artist. Um, art sort of found me and um, it's been an evolution and it's still evolving. So I'm going to share my screen right now and get right into it. So um, first I'm going to take you back to the old days when I was born. And um, this is a, actually a historical photo of the Santa Clara Valley. And um, this is where I grew up over 70 years ago. And I remember it being a rich agricultural area, um, lots of small farms, fruit orchards all around. And this was way before it was called Silicon Valley. So it was a whole different place. It was quite beautiful and it was popularly called the Valley of Heart's Delight. I was born in San Jose and raised in the community called Japantown, which today is one of the three surviving Japantowns in the United States. My parents were actually born in San Francisco. Oops. All right. And, um, so they were second generation Japanese Americans, or the term in Japanese is Nisei. They moved to San Jose in the late 1930s, where my dad started a small fertilizer manufacturing business. He served the small farmers and flower growers in the valley and on the peninsula, many of whom were Asian American. My mother's cousins owned a small farm in Santa Clara. And this is a photo of my mom in front and her mother, uh, her sister and cousin hanging out behind. Unfortunately, within a few years, these happy days were interrupted by World War II, when the whole family was removed and imprisoned by the US government in American concentration camps, along with over 120,000 others of Japanese descent. This is a photo of Heart Mountain uh, Camp, where they stayed. And I have some other family photos of camp as well. This one shows both uh, sets of grandparents, my mom seated on the right and my sister in the middle. My grandfather, uh, he's sit sitting in front with the hat, holding the hat. He was active in the Buddhist community at Heart Mountain, so th these are some of his uh, friends in that community. And you can see Heart Mountain just looming in the background. These are both of my grandmothers and my mom, and again, my sister. My sister Celia was three years old when they were taken to camp. And so she was a third generation Japanese, as I am, a sansei. And so she spent her toddler years basically behind barbed wire. And um, this is one of the few photos I have of my maternal grandparents together when they were at Heart Mountain. Unfortunately, they passed away when I was quite young, so I have limited memories of them. Before the war, they lived in Monterey. 
Hikoshichi was a fisherman and a gardener. And he also made sake on the sly and he got busted many times. And Haruyo was a teacher and also worked long hard hours in the abalone canneries. So I was born in 1949, four years after the family had returned to San Jose from Heart Mountain. And you can imagine the kind of discrimination and racism they encountered, um, even though they were American citizens. Then gradually they began to rebuild their lives. And fortunately, my dad's parents lived with us. And this is um, a photo from the early 1900s when just about when they were uh, coming to the States. So when our folks went to work, um, the grandparents took care of me and my two sisters. And um, the blessing was that this is how I got exposed to Japanese art and culture at an early age because they were both quite artistic. My grandfather was a retired photographer and he loved doing calligraphy. In fact, before the war, he had a photography studio on Kearney Street in San Francisco. And he took these amazing photographs um, in the area now called the Marina District. These were taken during the Panama Pacific International Exposition in 1915. Amazingly, these buildings were constructed right after the 1906 earthquake and fire and were completed by 1915. Pretty amazing. And you may recognize the last photo of the Palace of Fine Arts. It's the only structure still uh, standing and partly the reason is because it was renovated between 1964 and 1967. So now a little bit about my grandmother, Sumi. She was a floral artist and taught Japanese flower arranging called Ikebana. She also designed and created Western style clothing and hats and like the hat you see in this photo and also Japanese kimono. She taught me a lot about Japanese textiles. Here are a few examples of Japanese and Okinawan textiles. And this inspired my interest in world textiles in my later years. I eventually studied weaving and fiber arts, and I traveled to amazing weaving centers in Guatemala, Peru, and Mexico. These are samples from three areas of Peru and the right lower uh, corner is from Guatemala and it's indigo dyed ikat woven cotton. I'll be sharing some photos of my time in Guatemala later in my talk. But in short, all these influence began shaping my art aesthetic. Now, fast forward to the 1960s against the backdrop of the civil rights movement the Black Power Movement, and the anti-Vietnam War era. My peers and I were becoming more politically aware, and we wanted to know more about race and identity. It was a time of growing political consciousness. From 1967 to 69, I was an undergrad at UC Davis when the Third World Liberation Front movements at San Francisco State and UC Berkeley were in full swing. At UCD, I worked with a group of students under the guidance of Professor Isao Fujimoto. You can see pictured up on the right. And he co-founded the first Asian American Studies course at UC Davis, among many other social justice projects around the world. He challenged the hierarchy between faculty and students, and he valued intergenerational knowledge. In fact, last year was a 50th year celebration of the Asian American Studies Department at UCD. And Isao Fujimoto was the guest of honor at the symposium and art exhibit curated by artist educator Scott Suchitani. Isao is now 87 years old 
but he still has that spirited gift of bringing people together. I should mention here that besides um, working on the um, Asian American Studies, I actually studied in the textile arts department at UCD, which actually also influenced my decision to travel to Peru 17 years later. So now back to the 60s. Isao was a great mentor to many of us students, and like others, I was exploring my own cultural identity. So by the end of 1969, I quit school, um, got a job and saved some money, and I traveled to Japan in 1970. I was on a mission to discover not only who I was, but also who I wasn't. While in Japan, I had the opportunity to work during the World Expo in Osaka, pictured on the left, and take art classes, meet relatives for the first time, teach English, and generally experience my roots in Japan. And undoubtedly, it left a very deep impression in many ways. So, um, hold on. After, um, whoa. After four months in Japan, I returned to the States, and of all places, I moved to Eugene, Oregon to complete my degree at the University of Oregon. As it turned out, most of my education took place outside the classroom, literally on the streets. Almost immediately, I got involved with the migrant farm workers' struggle in Oregon and organizing around the great boycott and workers' rights. Of course, I was still active in the anti-war movement. My friends created posters and broadsides. And remember, there were no computers then. So everything was done manually and printed on either an offset printing press or mimeographed or silk screened by hand. This poster, this kind of funky poster was done by one of the anti-war groups in Eugene. But probably the most impactful experience uh, for me <clears throat> while I was there was working with members of the Eugene chapter of the Black Panther Party. Many people aren't even aware they had a chapter there. On the right is a copy I've saved of their typewritten Black Manifesto newsletter. It's an amazing historical record of what was going on in Eugene through the eyes of the black community. In fact, there were so many racist encounters with the Eugene police that um, the writers of the, of the newsletter created a reporting form um, so people could track instances of quote unquote driving while black. On the left is a photo of one of the rallies at the university in the late 60s. Just like the other chapters across the United States, they established a free breakfast program for children, for black and non-black kids, and a liberation school where I volunteered. Unfortunately, by 1970, the party was splitting up due to disruption by the FBI's counterintelligence program, or COINTELPRO. As you probably know, Oregon has historically been a stronghold of the KKK, the John Birch Society, and many other white supremacist groups. We on campus tried to address racism by organizing symposiums like this in this photo here. While I was living in Eugene, I was targeted by overt racism that I had never experienced in the Bay Area. I was harassed by men in pickup trucks with gun racks. Sounds stereotypical, but it really happened. And they would drive by and shout all kinds of racial slurs. Or another time, my friends from Korea had a cross burned into, onto their lawn. But amazingly, these incidents just strengthened my resolve to fight against racism. Amazingly, by the summer of 72, I did graduate even though, as I said, most of my so-called education happened outside the classroom. But my non-classroom education wasn't over yet. Next, I joined my Guatemalan classmate on a road trip to return to his country. 
We traveled in a group of seven of us in two cars throughout Mexico to Guatemala, where I stayed for half a year. Because of my love of pre-Columbian textiles, I was in heaven, visiting village after village, learning about local weaving traditions. But most memorable was moving to a tiny village called La Bola de Oro in the highlands. Thanks to my Guatemalan friend, I was introduced to a Cachiquel Mayan indigenous family who I would stay with for seven weeks. This is Maruca carrying baby Ophelia and her husband Esteban. I stayed in their home. Um, there was no running water, no electricity, no flush toilet. So um, it was quite a rustic experience. I learned about their daily lives by living it with them. And I would join Esteban as he hiked out to tend the fields, raising corn and beans. He didn't own the land, but was a sharecropper for a large landowner, which was a common arrangement there. On other days, I would do the chores with Maruca, cooking beans, grinding corn for tortillas, gathering wood to build the kitchen, wash clothes like you see on the left side, or walking several kilometers to get water from a community well. And if you ask me, Maruca had a much harder life than Esteban. Pictured here is the neighbor who was a weaver. She generously showed me some backstrap weaving techniques. And I uh, tried my best, <laughs> let's put it that way. Besides learning about their culture of hand-woven textiles, I also learned about their long history of political oppression and hardship. I believe that experience has had one of the deepest effects on my life and my art. It was very difficult to leave Guatemala as I had developed quite a kinship with the family and the culture. And sadly, two and a half years after I left, their whole community perished in the earthquake and floods of 1976. Upon my return to the Bay Area, the Asian American cultural arts movement was exploding in music, dance, art, performance. It was an exciting time. My peers were establishing a non-Eurocentric presence through the arts. Bridge Magazine was a, one of the early Asian American magazines and came out of New York. It offered writings of the movement, articles, political commentary, art, poetry, news. For many of us, it was starting to feel like we as Asian Americans were finally being seen. There were very few positive Asian role models in the media. If anything, we experienced racist stereotypes or we just didn't see ourselves at all. Pictured here is one of the first musical albums that came out in 1973 by Nobuko Miyamoto, Chris Ijima, and Charlie Chin. They wrote their original folk-inspired music, and it was politically geared towards people of color fighting for social justice. Today, Nobuko continues her activism through her multicultural organization called Great Leap promoting cross-cultural exchange through creative practice. The band Hiroshima emerged in LA in 1974. They're still performing and touring and were in the forefront of introducing a fusion of R&B and pop music, known for incorporating Western and Asian instruments. Pictured on the right shows a common scene in those days Musicians would get together and do these impromptu jam sessions with friends. This magazine called East Wind came out in the 80s and published information about polit politics and culture of Asians in the US. It included examples of what was happening in the visual arts at the time. So I was really drawn to this magazine. Artists and their art were featured like in this portraits visions section including Tomie Arai, Orlando Castillo, Santiago Bos, and Yong Soon Min. 
I'd like to read this descriptive paragraph. Quote, contained in these visual artworks are stories of Asian American life. They affirm an Asian American experience marked by the richness of various national ancestries and diverse cultural traditions. These pieces project the multidimensionality of a people's experience, expressing their spirit, personality, and living motion. They evoke the keenly felt warmth of the familiar and intimate. People we know, faces and bodies that are indeed ourselves." Unquote. This just hit it on the head for me. Um, here are two of uh, the artist's works. Tomie Arai, her portrait of a Chinese family, 1984. Tomie is also still very active in the arts and social justice movement in New York. She's a highly respected artist and activist. This is Orlando Castillo's, Castillo's Sugar Workers of Negros, 1986. He believed that, quote, art is not merely a creation of the mind, but the mirror of the artist's involvement with his surroundings and his life experiences unquote. Today this magazine has returned online as Eastwind Ezine, headed by one of the original editors, the prolific and multi-talented Eddie Wong. In this theater arts was Sachiko Nakamura, who was at the cutting edge of performance art. Her shows were based on her personal life story as an Asian American woman, and this was something totally new to us. Um, on the right, you can see Robert Kikuchi and Goho, a multi-talented musician and performer back in the day. And he and his wife, Nancy Wong, established the Asian American storytelling duo Ethnotech. They're still very active in the Bay Area and internationally and are celebrating their 40th anniversary as Ethnotech next year, I believe. So this is just these examples are just a tip of the iceberg. I couldn't show you all the examples I wanted to. There was such an abundance of creativity and it got everyone very excited to keep creating. People felt the need to express themselves in new ways. And for me, it was just beginning. In 1974 came the opportunity for me to study Taiko with Grandmaster Seiji Tanaka founder of San Francisco Taiko Dojo, the first Taiko group established in North America. So I joined a group of Asian Americans in the South Bay and we became the original performing members of San Jose Taiko. There were seven of us originally, four of us women, which was unusual or unheard of since women in Japan were not allowed to play at the time. That fact motivated me even more to stick with it, no matter how intense the training was. And believe me, it was grueling. Here we're pictured on a float in a parade in San Francisco when the emperor of Japan was visiting. Playing taiko was an uncharted form of self-expression at the time. Since most of us were Japanese Americans, our experience here was quite different from that of a person born in Japan. Our music was influenced by American and world music, including jazz, rock, African rhythms, Latin percussion. But as we discovered our voices through playing taiko, two of my colleagues and I, Linda Ito and PJ Hirabayashi, decided to establish a wearable art business collaboration called Earthenware. This was another form of Asian American self-expression, creating our own line of contemporary ethnic inspired clothing. It was also a way for me to integrate my love of textiles of Asia and Latin America. I got to travel to Peru to visit indigenous weavers and traditional dyers. I met Japanese Peruvians and learned about their history as well. I continued to approach the world um, world textiles as a way to make connections between cultures and people. 
Then in 1986, I moved to Oakland to set up my art practice and another new chapter opened. Phasing out of the wearable art area, I produced a line of hand-painted silk wall pieces using a stylized textile motif as my subject matter. I incorporated graphic images from Japanese, pre-Columbian, and Celtic origins. In 1988, I co-developed an artist live work complex we call 911 Studios, where I continue to maintain my studio today. Our mission has been to provide affordable work live studios for practicing artists. By 1990, I met Flo Wong and Betty Kano, co-founders of AWA, the Asian American Women Artists Association. So I um, was privileged to join at that time. And I began, began tapping into the rich Bay Area art scene. Um, and my work, of course, began to evolve again. I began exploring plaster, fabric, handmade paper, upcycled materials, you name it. As I became involved in a few humanitarian and cultural exchange projects in Nicaragua and Mexico, my art began to reflect what I witnessed in those places, especially after visiting various sacred places or sacred sites. I also drew inspiration from my experiences living in Guatemala. I met artisans in their villages and witnessed their difficult way of life. They shared their origin stories that colored my art. I volunteered at a primary school for indigenous Mexican children and observed blatant racial injustice. As I looked through this lens of the struggle of, of indigenous peoples, I dug deeper into their histories of oppression. These pieces address the genocide of indigenous peoples of North America. In this triptych entitled Legacy, rough wood and soil come alive with the names of many of these native peoples, with the accusations of the betrayed yearning for truth and justice. It was included in an exhibit at the Mission Cultural Center in San Francisco and also at the Jamaica Arts Center in New York, commemorating the 500th anniversary of the invasion of Christopher Columbus to the Americas. These two pieces honor the Zapatista indigenous movement in Southern Mexico, which I created right after the massacre of 45 indigenous people by federal troops in the town of Acteal, Chiapas, Mexico in 1997. My art also has dealt with issues around immigration. These pieces were part of a series, specifically the imprisonment of Asian immigrants at the Angel Island Immigration Prison in the early 1900s. This piece entitled Missed Fortunes spoke to more of the xenophobia and racial hysteria against Asians at the turn of the century. Sadly, we continue to witness the same type of hysteria in today's America. I also have addressed the World War II mass incarceration of Japanese Americans, like this piece called The Writing on the Wall. As we know, racism and xenophobia didn't just pop up in 1941 when the war started. And I wanted to highlight that fact Using distressed materials, I tried to conjure up a sense of desolation and neglect, a weathered chunk of wood, the altered remains of an Asian-style screen, images of barracks. As you get closer, you can see continuous lines of typewritten text, which are actual racist slurs I took straight from history books from the early 1900s. In this piece called The Game of Go, I refer to one of my grandfather Kiroku's pastimes, playing this Japanese board game of intense strategy, attacks, and counterattacks, like those used in war. I incorporated this metaphor of a board game 
to refer to how the U.S. government used various strategies to round up the Japanese and put them away like pawns in a game. This piece is dedicated to my grandmother Sumi, suggesting memories of her life before camp, Japanese folk art, the beckoning cats, the koi fish banners. My drawings of plant life refer to the only plants that could survive in the barren desert in Wyoming. As a flower arrangement teacher, she sadly was no longer able to create art with fresh flowers in camp. So I continued my visual arts practice through the 1990s, but by the end of that decade, I switched gears once again, and I co-founded a four-person taiko ensemble dedicated to creating a new non-traditional interpretation of taiko. We named ourselves after a beautiful Japanese cherry blossom tree, Somiyoshino. We created all of our own choreography and compositions, sometimes blended with non-Japanese instruments. We also were fortunate to have collaborated with noted Bay Area dance companies, including Suli Ju of Facing East Dance and Music, Chrissy Kiefer of the Dance Brigade, Robert Moses Kin, Alleluia Panis of Cool Arts, and others. Although I was on hiatus, Supposedly, from my visual arts practice, I was involved in much of the visual presentation and costuming. So it was actually quite a satisfying multimedia artistic endeavor. But by the time I moved on from the group in 2009, I was ready to get back into my studio art practice. After all the physicality of playing taiko, I felt the need to bring down the scale of my mixed media artwork to a subtler, quieter place. I created a new series combining vintage world textiles, handmade paper, Japanese hand stitching called sashiko, natural dyes, and image transfers. These are very small. They're only about either 12 inches square or 8 inches square. My very first collage incorporated weathered uh, Japanese calligraphy paper used by my grandfather. The energy of the materials dictate how each piece comes together. These are very intimate sketches, sort of like a distillation of my life lessons. My subject matter ranges from very contemplative to heavier issues, like the devastation during World War II of the once independent Ryukyu Islands of Okinawa. I also have created work around the 2011 earthquake tsunami in Fukushima, Japan, and other issues of memory, displacement, and loss. So we're almost to present day. Um, in 2014 and 2015, I was an artist in residence in Oaxaca, Mexico. The first year I was there, I studied natural dyeing uh, on handmade paper, as you could see on the left. I explored using Mexican indigo dyes on paper instead of fabric. On the right is a portion of my Day of the Dead altar and installation. I also began exploring the hand cut paper process inspired by the Mexican papel picado and Japanese katagami cut art forms. While traveling in the nearby state of Puebla, I visited the workshop of an Otomi indigenous artist who created traditional amate bark paper, like on the right, originally used for ritual purposes. These hand cut figures were cut out by shamans into shapes that are said to enclose the spirits of plants and gods. I then researched the names of indigenous nations and languages that are still present in Mexico. On the left, you can see um, the names of um, 68 um, nations, indigenous nations and languages that are still present. And uh, 
according to a renowned scholar that I interviewed in Puebla, um, their, their numbers are actually dwindling every day. So here I cut out the names and I placed them on a dyed sheet of Amate paper. So one of the first cut out pieces I created was called My Will. And this is the text from the actual will that my grandfather wrote when he was imprisoned in Heart Mountain. And I'd like to read you the last two lines. Quote, we human beings are passing through the period of the greatest tragedy in human history. It seems to me that it was inevitable weakness of human races in evolution onto higher plane. All in karma, signed Kiroku Bep. This piece is called La Venganza de los Milagros, which is a statement of resistance against the U.S. administration's border wall. In Spanish, la venganza means revenge, and milagros are small votive offerings used to pray for good fortune or healing in Mexico. The individual milagros in my piece have become a unified force and transform themselves into powerful figures that break through walls between nations and people. This piece is a tribute to the courageous migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers who struggle to defy persecution. On September 26, 2014, 43 students from the Ayotzinapa Rural Teachers College were abducted and disappeared in southern Mexico. Their families, friends, and human rights groups are still seeking justice. This is dedicated to the Ayotzinapa 43 and is a plea for the demands of the families to finally find the truth and to bring the perpetrators of the crime to justice. It refers to conflict between people distilled into three words, no, yes, see, until ultimately the voice of the people can prevail. So I had just returned from Oaxaca and I was just overwhelmed with the, all the news of more killings of unarmed African-Americans to police violence. And this was soon after Michael Brown had been murdered in Ferguson. Somehow I needed to address this in my art. So I found the names of 100 black women and men who were killed that year. And I started cutting their names as a symbolic gesture to honor their lives. As we know, there were many, many more killed. Unity pays tribute to the words of the late Japanese American Nisei activist and civil rights leader, Yuri Kochiyama. The white text is an excerpt from her speech entitled Mothers and Daughters from June 1998. The black text in the center circle is the word unity translated into 63 languages. Yuri Kochiyama was a role model who guided, supported, and educated us around national and international struggles. Her call for unity and her legacy lives on and will continue to impact and inspire future generations. In 2019, my work was included in an exhibition at the San Francisco Presidio entitled, Then They Came For Me, Incarceration of Japanese Americans During World War II and the Demise of Civil Liberties. The focal point of this piece is the civilian exclusion poster, you can see on the left, that notified Japanese descendants to report for incarceration after the start of the war. I cut out the words, I am an American, and the poster stands in my grandmother's antique vase that she used for creating her flower arrangements. I wanted to show the irony of a personal artistic object 
like a vase filled with sand with this sign rising out of it. The pleading images of words cut into the wartime poster is visceral and demeaning in contrast to the vase, which symbolizes harmony and grace in the art of flower arranging. I created this piece at the beginning of the pandemic last year, initially to honor those in prison during World War II, but I also wanted to honor the present asylum seekers and migrant families who have been separated, put in detention prisons, or are languishing in refugee camps at the border. This is a call to put an end to these racist and unjust practices and to stop repeating history. And the final piece I'd like to share with you. Each year I create an altar dedicated to loved ones and ancestors in the spirit of the Mesoamerican custom during the Day of the Dead at the end of October, beginning of November. Last November, I wanted to honor the black lives that have been lost to police violence. I created uh, cut paper portraits, beginning with George Floyd. And then I added portraits of women like Sandra Bland, Breonna Taylor, Tanisha Anderson, and Dominique Remy Fells. I'm now con continuing to create more portraits of women who have perished, including Cherise Francis, Rikia Boyd, and Miriam Carey. So today, I want to keep bringing attention to the memory of not only these African Americans, um, but to also stand with all those who have been assaulted or killed as a result of ongoing racism and acts of hate. Thank you for listening, and I will turn it back to you, Halavi. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much, Ellen. Thank you uh, for not only sharing your work, but uh, talking about your non-classroom education, which is so important part of your art making. And I think like all these subjects are not taught in schools. And you know, this is alternate history and we all need to, you know, uh, learn about it. Some of the things we are running short of time. Uh, so I won't, uh, um, you know, not speak much, but I would like to take this opportunity to thank you uh, before we switch off the recording. Uh, and um, you know transition to q and a session uh, i would also like to thank uh, two wonderful people brandis uh, hafthor's daughter gallery manager exhibitions and public programs at cca thank you so much for all your support and help uh, to run this uh, event and also jimmy austin director of exhibitions and public programs Thank you so much. Thank you, both of you. Um, a big thank you to all our previous speakers um, and, of course, to distinguished audience members. All of you, thank you so much for joining us today.